Well, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all now to uh, this evening's or this afternoon, depending on where you are meeting, or this morning's even, meeting of the Kipling Society uh, in spring of 2024. Uh, I am joining you from my office at Roehampton University, and our guest is joining us from his home, I think, Dave, in Connecticut. Uh, it's, I shan't use up any of your time because I want to leave as much time as possible this evening to hear about fascinating collection of, of Dave's, but uh, I do want to leave, use a minute just to uh, welcome guests from a, another organization tonight. It's not only Kipling Society members here tonight, but also members of the American Trust for the British Library. Uh, an organization that has uh, a more important role to play than ever, given the bad straits that the library finds itself in at the moment. Uh, but tonight, it's my pleasure as uh, chairman of the Gipping Society to welcome tonight's speaker, our current honorary president, Dave Richards. Uh, Dave is a distinguished American lawyer, uh, and I think it's safe to say that he is the greatest living collector of Kipling rare books and Kipling uh, manuscripts and other Kipling ephemera. Um, he formed his collection uh, over a, a long period of time uh, and donated it to the Beinecke Library at Yale, where it is uh, available to all uh, accredited researchers. And I've actually seen it myself when I was a PhD student before I even had the pleasure of belonging to the society and meeting Dave. Yeah. Uh, but tonight, Dave is going to tell us about how the collection originally formed, and we're going to see some pictures of some of the most treasured items within the collection. Uh, so please, over to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Alex, and hello to uh, all my many friends within the Kipling Society and the folks uh, on, of course, from the American Trust uh, for the British Library. A lot of these facts were actually first formulated uh, by me because I was invited by the ATBL to give one of the annual Breslauer lectures and uh, one of the uh, current uh, the current chair of, of the ATBL asked me uh, to be the give the third annual lecture and I was into the statistics then because I was just about to publish my Kipling bibliography which came out in 2017. Um, but I thought that simply as people interested in the life and works of this extraordinary man, and many of you, Jan in particular, but others, Andrew Lysett, uh, John, um, have read actually more of what Kipling wrote um, than I have or perhaps ever will. Um, but... Uh, I have handled more of them, uh, not only than anybody alive, but uh, dare I say it, anybody dead. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, I am uh, not disrespectful of them because as I'll tell you about, I have, because they collected him back in the day when he was alive, when he was young. Extraordinarily, the first Kipling uh, appearance at auction was in 1898. Uh, he hadn't been back to London very long then. Um, one of the great tragedies of my life is I have Prime Minister Lord Roseberry's copy of Departmental Ditties. And when I moved from my house to my apartment, um, I put it somewhere and I haven't found it in the last six years, but perhaps I will. Uh, but that tells you how early people were collecting Kipling. So remarks broadly titled Collecting Kipling might cover a variety of these themes, and these remarks will. My computer Kipling collection catalog, which covers 35 years of acquisitions from eBay and auction houses and rare book dealers in the United States and Great Britain, and most recently at a Christie's online auction in Paris three weeks ago, uh, which just arrived last night, but too late to include in this talk, is uh, 950 pages in length. And at its end, transcribed over the three decades of its composition, I've compiled something of a little commonplace book of sayings, some by Kipling himself, on the contested history and sheer difficulty of collecting Kipling, and more generally on the nature of collecting, which has been called the gentle madness, on the importance of the literary history of the collector, 
and on the significance of provenance, uh, that is, who used to own the copy in question that is now safe with you. The book dealer and first director of the Lilly Library, a great rare book library at the University of Indiana, a man named David Randall, noted in Publishers Weekly in 1936, following Kipling's death that year, quote, Rudyard Kipling was the earliest writer whose first editions were systematically and enthusiastically collected by contemporaries. No writer in all book collecting history has ever had, during his lifetime, such devoted followers as his have proven themselves to be. Practically all the problems inherent in the collecting of moderns were first faced by Kipling collectors, and their researches guided later enthusiasts parenthetical, including this one, when they in turn pursued other game. A complete Kipling collection has never been formed and never can be formed, for there's simply not enough, as I will demonstrate in some statistics, of his rarities to go around." Close quote. In a book also appearing in 1936, journalist Lowell Thomas, in his introduction to his great Kipling stories together with the life of Rudyard Kipling, noted the opinion of the famous English-born bookman, Mitchell Kinnerly. He was the manager of the New York City office of the British publisher, John Lane. And he was then also president of the auction house, Anderson Galleries, some of whose catalogs are themselves first editions of Kipling manuscripts, the way we play the game and count it. And he was then co-founder of Park Bernay, the largest house in America when purchased by Sotheby's in 1964, when I was a sophomore in college. Kennerly opined that, quote, more money has been paid by collectors for original manuscripts and first editions of Kipling during his lifetime than any other author, close quote. Kipling himself, in response to a prospective bibliographer in 1912, gave a reason for the high degree of difficulty in identifying and then collecting his voluminous works. Quote, if I had friends to whom I could refer you in the name of manner of dates, and references, etc., for the bibliography, I would be delighted for you to complete it. But with my habit of publishing in scattered magazines, plus translations, piracies, unauthorized reprints, etc., it would mean much more than proofreading for me and I am, in many cases, the only person who can lay hands on the information, close quote. So with those gentle words, Kipling turned down his first serious offer of bibliography. Uh, nor, however, did Kipling have a high opinion of those who, with or without guidance of bibliographers, competed to collect his works. In 1921, writing to his friend Colonel H.W. Fielden, quote, which reminds me, that your thoughtful cutting out of the times was the first scene of the Kipling sale. Golly, what fools collectors are, double exclamation point. I've managed to overcome my offense at that. In a memoir from 1969 by his friend Rupert Grayson, who'd been wounded in the same World War I battle in which Kipling's son had perished, the Battle of Luz. And then he became Carrie and Rudyard's guests at Bateman's for a week in January 1926, and he recalled, quote, it was my task to burn the contents of the waste paper basket. Kipling had an intense dislike of his fame being exploited and took every possible precaution that none of his manuscripts should fall into the hands of people who would sell them later to collectors, nor did he write to anyone who was likely to sell his letters, close quote. It may not surprise you that Grayson's book, titled Voyage Not Completed, is itself a Kipling first edition because it contains a first printing of letters from Kipling long after his death, subsequently reprinted in Professor Thomas Penny's six-volume edition of Kipling's Selected Letters. As for provenance, Wilmarth Lewis, the founder of Yale's Lewis Walpole Library and once the president and my predecessor, as president of the Yale Library Association, wrote in his autobiography, Collector's Progress, to know that your copy of a book was formerly in a famous library, 
to know when and how much it was sold, who bought it, and what then became of it, when it reached your own shelf, to recognize the marks of ownership of these former owners, perhaps to find the lot numbers of the various auction sales through which the book is passed, this is the ultimate satisfaction to a collector." Close quote. And I absolutely agree. Wilmarth Lewis's idol, Horace Walpole, of whom he was the greatest collector in the world, turned his house into a library, which is now part of the Yale Library. Commenting on the contents of his library at Walpole's library at Star Strawberry Hill, wrote about provenance, quote, this is Walpole, such well-attested descent is the genealogy of the objects of vertu, not so noble as those of the peerage, but on a par with those of racehorses. In all three, especially the pedigree of peers and rarities, the line is often continued by many insignificant names, meaning the collectors. Now, in the line of significant names of my predecessor Kipling collectors and bibliographers, often one and the same, and you'll know these names, some of you, the English barrister E. W. Martindale, the Philadelphia lawyer Ellis Ames Ballard, the Harvard librarian Flora Livingston, the Canadian lawyer James McGregor Stewart, I, a lawyer myself, like everyone else on that list, oddly, except Mrs. Livingston, well, in this catalog of quotations on collecting, with another quotation from Kipling himself, from his 1914 speech, first published in the Geographical Journal, which if you're a collector, you need that, not some aspects of travel. Forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, I will not go on with the catalog, he wrote, although I feel like the commercial traveler in the story who said, quote, if you don't care to look at my samples, do you mind my having a look at them? It's been so long since I've seen them." Close quote. The disposition of rare book collectors and collections is of two kinds, depending on the nature of the collection, if we are gonna make a binary classification. If it is one of what our tribe of gentle madmen and women call high spots, being an agglomeration of important works by several famous authors, where the only two Kipling items might be the Jungle Books and Just So Stories, it will likely be dispersed at auction to be acquired by other collectors. And your monument as that collector is the auction catalog that the house puts together for you. If you are a single author collector, like me, you're part of a vanishing breed in the modern world, but you're more likely, alternatively, to gift that collection in an act of scholarship to a rare book library, although there are exceptions, like the first serious Kipling bibliographer E.W. Martindale, of whom more later, who sold his collection at auctions in London and then in New York City. Collecting Kipling, as I said, began early. He arrived in London from India in 1889, and I still possess a copy of the first Indian edition of Departmental Ditties, which bears, as I said, the book plate of Prime Minister Rosebery, acquired from his rare book dealer in 1890, only one year after Rudyard's taking up residence in London, and only four years after Departmental Ditties was first published in Lahore. Consequently, there are many such collections in many institutions gathered from the gifts or dispersals at auction of Kipling collections from many great collectors, over now the past 120 years, several of whom I will name check today. What might be called the Ur Collection is the so-called Kipling file in the British Library itself, the author's personal collection of his works given by his family and running through posthumous editions appearing through 1939. In my computer collection catalog, in which I identify those institutional collections which have copies of the edition in question if it's rare at all, the phrase Kipling file shows up 261 times. Gotta love word search. The titles run from the works published by his family when he was a schoolboy through all the Indian editions except those he suppressed 
it's the only collection besides mine to all hold all 10 editions of departmental ditties, such that when Tom Penny wanted to do his Variorum edition, he only had to go to the Beinecke Library to spread before him all 10 editions across a long table where he could compare the changes that Kipling made in the various editions in poems he'd already published, making those later editions, first editions of that version of those poems. It's a complicated game. It may be why lawyers in particular like to play it. Uh, it even includes one of the American pirated editions that he so loathed. At one point, Rudyard had 32 lawsuits going in the United States against pirate publishers. The copy of Out of India there, published without his permission in New York City in 1895, made up of clippings from the Indian newspapers that he had sent back as a reporter, has this manuscript note. Page 44, page 55, page 77, page 105, page 167, page 182, page 199, page 203, page 279, page 340, not underscored, written by me, RK, with circles in ink drawn around those passages on those pages. Now, while researching my bibliography of Kipling, published by the British Library in 2010, after research there on many trips to London, I visited in person fully 47 institutional collections in the United States, Great Britain, and Canada. And I visited one virtually in the Republic of South Africa at the University of Cape Town, which as many of you know, the special collections suffered a devastating fire in April, 2023. Now, this wide ranging effort was necessary because as previously noted, there is no complete collection, Kipling collection, in the world in one place. His publishing career, including posthumous first editions, extended over 73 years, and over 4,000 separate printings of his work exist. Much of his prose and verse appeared in newspapers and magazines far from the world's literary capitals, and their book publication was spread over six continents, India, Great Britain, the United States and Canada, Australia, South America, and South Africa. His earliest work, as you all know, was in family published paperbacks and provincial newspapers uh, are, that works are, those works are extremely rare. And through exposure to the wet and heat of the Asian outposts of late 19th century British empire, and much now known to be from his teenage journalist pen, was first published anonymously or under ever-changing pseudonyms. Tom Penny has tried to catalog and decipher as many as possible, used to fill the empty columns in his school newspaper in Devon, of which he was appointed editor when the newspaper was revived to keep the anxious and overly bright young man busy. And then the Indian periodicals, which employed him in that country when they couldn't figure out and fill the columns on their daily or weekly editions. And Kipling himself sometimes suppressed works or sued to do so after they'd been published without his sanction. Alternatively, he maintained the practice of including some previously uncollected or unpublished poems or stories in all his single volume or multi-volume editions, beginning, as you might have inferred, with the second through fourth editions of departmental ditties which thus, again, each became first editions, and ending with the posthumously published Sussex edition of his collected works. And because of the lack of international copyright protection in my country until 1891, 91, some unauthorized American issues are true firsts of Kipling's works published in covers, paper or hard. On his way from India to London, in a bookshop visited when passing through Nikko, Japan in May, 1889, Kipling claimed to have seen a list of New York pirate publisher George Munn's seaside library with his Indian railway titles. This problem continued virtually until his death almost half a century later with printings of still uncollected poems or stories long after copyright 
without his authorization in private presses in limited editions. Kipling himself compounded for the completest collector like me the problem by making frequent textual changes in successive editions from magazine or other periodical appearance to a collection of stories or poems when republished between covers to their final appearance when republished in the multi-volume collected editions at his life's end, the Burwash edition in the United States. And I've just discovered from a copy of Out of India, which was mailed by his broker to Macmillan to the Sussex edition, where Kipling has made 300 changes inside for the Sussex edition. And that only just arrived here a couple of weeks ago. Flora Livingston, in her original bibliography of Kipling, published in 1927 after a quarter century of research, had listed 404 titles published through 1926, including some significant and collectible editions, which were not first editions, but collectors loved them, collectors bought them, and she put them in. She also established a bibliographical precedent by listing both English and American first editions, regardless of stopwatch precedence. Prior bibliographers followed the rule called follow the flag. So if it's a UK first edition, it was a first edition, even if it actually was printed in the United States first, which had happened with Kipling several times. In 1938, she issued a supplemental volume, adding another 126 works two years after Kipling's death of entirely new entries for the periods 1884 through 1926, now bumping her total to 630 titles. James McGregor Stewart, the Canadian barrister, who asked if he could help Flora update her editions of 10 and 20 years before, but she was then losing her eyesight. So he decided to do it himself. And he published his Kipling bibliography in 1959 largely published on his own collection, which by then, again, beginning in the 1930s, buying from the collectors, selling their, particularly during the depression, English collectors selling in America in the 1929-1941 era, based largely on his own collection, then the largest in the world, shelved in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he described some 783 books or pamphlets or broadsides, which was an increase of Livingston's count of about 25%. Now my bibliography, and I must repeat that wonderful phrase, if I have seen farther, it's by standing on the shoulders of others. It appeared in 2010, and it names all his books of sole or joint authorship, books with contributions in a separate section, books with prefaces in a separate section, books with private letters in a separate section, and collected sets. And that number is 937 titles in the 50 years added by me to Stewart's count of about 20% and included titles never know, first editions to Livingston or Stewart in their day, although published by them very often with Kipling's private letters, which were unknown to those bibliographers. But the careful accumulation of titles and bibliographers subsequent to Mrs. Livingston's first heroic efforts in 1926 and 1938, my own included, has not ended there. On the website of my bibliography's American publisher, Oak Knoll Press, I have for the past 14 years regularly followed as a bit of a blog post updated versions of something called Editions and Corrections, which expands on the original text of my bibliography and now includes, since 2010, a further 11 titles of Kipling first editions, which I've discovered since 2010 and added to my collection at Yale and then added to that bibliographical record. So it should be note, noted that the uh, Kipling Collector faces both Plenitude, 937 titles, plus another 1,100 periodical appearances, should he or she, she decide to collect those, as I do, and as I was the first bibliographer to ever list in publication order over the C-section of my bibliography, 
And the number that um, uh, that then adds to that. But then there's a problem on the other end. The number of first editions that exist today in only single copies, at least in institutional collections, maybe there's something out there that hasn't appeared and will come out of an attic or an auction, is an amazing 52 titles, single editions. So almost 9% of all Kipling first edition titles, 80 of them, exist in only two known copies or fewer. And I myself have discovered 10 of these in my 40 years of collecting. And nobody else is ever going to have them. And I'm never going to have the ones the other people have. Unless I can figure out a way to sneak them out. But this combination of plenitude and poverty weighs heavily on the statistics of Kipling collections in institutional libraries. The British Library, for my friends on the ATBL on this talk, including the core Kipling file, has only 40% of my count of the titles, which includes the American pirate, pirate, pirate published printings, which the BL understandably lacks. Kipling had one pirate publication, not the many. The Ransom Center at the University of Texas, which built its Kipling collection by buying several of them and then selling duplicates at auction in New York City, including to me, has a few more at 43% above the BL's 40. The Library of Congress, which requires in this country deposit for copyright and thus has the only complete collection of the Doubleday copyright printings in America, which affix, effectively fix Kipling's copyrights in both the United States and the United Kingdom, and also houses the wonderful Carpenter and Chandler and Colt collections of Kipling, has 48%. Stewart's collection at Dalhousie University, magnificently housed in its own building, thank God I didn't have to do that, has 64%. But of course, other than a couple of things, duplicates, particularly of rare Canadian editions, which I have donated to the Stewart collection after I found a second one, has had no more editions since his death. So his is more or less topped out at 64%. And the collections then finally at Yale, which thank God include two prior collectors besides me, collecting long before I was born, includes 84%. But despite my best and continuing efforts, it's not likely to go much higher. And several of those collections with that only one or only two editions, if you were to have a your rail pass or a ticket to travel all around collections in the United States, you would have to go to many, many different collections to see every single one, which is one of the reasons why I have pictures of them of the rarest in the back of my bibliography. The best description of collecting I've ever encountered from the great collector and scholar of bibliography, G. Thomas Tanzel, in a 1998 essay in Studies of Bibliography says this, the process can be analyzed into several components, which include creation of order, fascination with chance, curiosity about the past and desire for understanding. The gathering of tangible things entails a constant engagement with contingency, and one is dazzled by the diverse succession of things that pass one, one's way. But what one finds is still a matter of chance. The connection between Kipling and gambling has often been made. Both, he concludes, involve jousting with fate. So I'll end my remarks by today by sharing with you some of the Kipling items which this gambler collector has gathered in the last two years. I've chosen 10 things, not all of them first editions or Kipling autograph manuscripts, although we'll have one of those, to demonstrate the points about collecting made by Tenzel. To repeat, the creation of order, the fascination with chance, curiosity about the past, and desire for understanding. Across Kipling's lifetime, they date from his schoolboy years through the end of his days. That itself 
is a function of the chance of what I've encountered over the last 48 months. But along the way, they'll allow me to make some observations about one, how modern collectors necessarily depend on the disbursement at auction of their predecessors' collections. Two, how pirated editions become themselves as first printings of something of Kipling's first editions in the canon, the way we classify them. Three, how Kipling's works have sometimes been enhanced by special printings. Four, how his publishers segmented the commercial market on which he depended and became the wealthiest art author in Anglo-America, if not in the world, with popular and deluxe editions. Five, I'm remembering my sequence, how his earliest bibliographer infuriated the author in printing juvenilia that Kipling would have preferred was forgotten and refused in his lifetime to collect. And then there were later issues such that, written on napkins and in front free end paper or fly leaves, Tom Penny had to publish an entire third volume of Kipling's collecting poems. Think of that. Until Tom did that, only two thirds of Kipling collecting poems were known to be readily available. Fourth, how Kipling was caricatured in his own time. Uh, uh, not fourth, sixth, seventh, how provenance is proven by a book plate and how auction catalogs contain valuable data for the bibliographer or the collector. And finally, how alia, as in Dickensia or Kipling alia, non-book or manuscript items, can inform our understanding of the author's relationships with others of and impact upon his own era. Alex, if I can have the first image. Share your screen. Certainly, Dave, yeah. This photograph, which I purchased within, again, the last two years, that's what this snapshot of my collection is, of the headmaster and assistant masters of the United Services Colleges at Westward Ho, seems to be taken about 1880. And it's been known for some time, even printed in the Kipling Journal back in June, 1981. However, this seems to be the only known example with the names of those pictured below the image. These men are known for a long time now to be the models for the masters described in Stocky and Co. In the book, Headmaster Cormel Price is the head or the Prussian Bates. Senior Headmaster William Carr Crofts is Mr. King. M.H. Pugh is Mr. Prout. Herbert Arthur Evans is Mr. Hartop. Chaplain Reverend George Wills is the Padre, or alternatively, the Reverend John Gillette. And the Reverend C.W.L. Bode, here seated on the ground with his Pocker Spaniel in his lap, is possibly Mason. Alex, please, the next. This is an unauthorized version of Recessional, published in 1899, but it contains three other poems, namely White Horses, The Absent-Minded Beggar, and The Old Issue, which Kipling later renamed The King. It is a Kipling first edition, although unauthorized, pirated, because it is the first book edition, that is between paper or hardcovers, of the old issue, which was first published in a periodical, like most of Kipling's poetry. Now, the book was published, as the image shows, if you can see it in the left, to the left, in the left-hand photo, in an edition limited to 25 numbered and reserved copies. Today, only nine are known to exist. But this copy may be the most important because it is not one of the number 25. And as you can see on the right, because it is inscribed in the upper right-hand corner, perhaps by the pirate publisher himself as a presentation copy and giving with the inscription a date of publication, which isn't in the book itself. 
So I think we can reliably intuit or infer that the publication was November 1899 or not earlier than October 1899, and that the pirate publisher was somebody whose signature is obscured. Maybe I'll find out sometime before I go to the great library in the sky. Maybe I won't, but I'll be working on it. The next one, please, Alan. Now, one of the great collectors was Sir William Garth, KC. And this is one of his auction sale books. And this is the interior of the front board of a specially bound volume of three stories, which Garth clipped from the pages of the children's magazine, St. Nicholas Magazine, from issues of 1893 and 1895. And those stories were The Potted Princess, Kalerwala and the Poison Stick, and The King's Ancus. I already had copies of these magazine issues, the entire issues, collected by Ellis Ames Ballard and in the boxes that he made for them. But pictured here is the book plate of Sir William Garth, KC, who after graduating from Oxford and called to the middle bar, carved to the bar at the Middle Temple, he emigrated to India and was an advocate at the High Court of Calcutta from, he dates, 1885 to 1913, which included the early years, actually later years, of Kipling's journalistic career in India. And then he was knighted in 1914, and he was made King's Counsel in 1919. Now, Garth managed to acquire from Kipling's chaplain, who we just talked about in that photo, at United Services College, many presentation copies given by the teenage author out in India to his old school padre. His collection, Garth's, including this volume, was sold at Sotheby's in 1923, and its scattered treasures are now to be found, I've checked, at Stewart's collection at Dalhousie, the Bird collection in the New York Public Library, the Ransom Center in Texas, Princeton University's Firestone Library, the Bancroft Library at the University of California, and the University of Virginia. Garth's own scrapbook of items and articles about Kipling is now also with Stewart's collection at Dalhousie, bound exactly like this volume in reddish brown Morocco and marbled boards. I didn't acquire this for the contents. I already had them, but for its provenance. For those of you who are book collectors, the great Sir William Osler, who published Kipling's letters uh, in his own uh, autobiography and was a great book collector who, uh, whose collection uh, was uh, given to the Yale Medical School, once described uh, provenance as the tertiary phase of bibliomania. I won't go further than that. Next. This is a power of attorney. And this is an example of Kiplingiana. It's a power of attorney dated 6 October, 1919, certifying the signatures, which you see at the document's foot, of Rudyard Kipling, Major General Simon Joseph Lovett, the 14th Lord Lovett, Viscount Alfred Milner, longtime Kipling friend, and later, as many of you know, is Sussex, na Sussex neighbor, who was also the chair of the Rhodes Trust, on which Rudyard served by this date as a trustee, and finally the Baronet Otto Bate, the proprietor of the Rand Gold Mines and Rose's house guest at the time of the ill-fated Jameson raid, which he helped finance, and as the real cognoscenti of you know, the poem If was not written by Kipling about George Washington. It, when published, followed a short story about Washington, it was actually published about Jameson, the leader of the Jameson raid. Bate succeeded Milner as chair of the Rhodes Trust in due course, and Lovett succeeded Bate. The witnesses this, to this power were the original two officers of the Rhodes Trust. As Jan and others among you know, I've long been fascinated by Kipling's infatuation with Rhodes, because my fellowship at Cambridge, like many overseas fellowship programs would never have occurred except for the example, it seems likely, of the Rhodes Scholarships. 
Consequently, I've done research at Rhodes House in Oxford, thrilled to be invited to sign the guest book there. I've gifted Yale with one of the three known copies of the verses Kipling wrote at Rhodes's death in 1902, the other being in the National Library of Zimbabwe today, and with the only two known Rhodes Scholar dinner menus signed by Kipling when he was a trustee. And I've authored two articles for the Kipling Journal on the Rhodes-Kipling relationship. This power of attorney, coming back to it, relates 17 years after the death in 1902 of the Colossus, as Cecil Rhodes was known, to the administration of farms in Melsetter, part of the Chamanimani district in modern Zimbabwe, formerly known, as you, many of you, most perhaps are old enough to know, was Rhodesia in our middle age. Next slide. Kipling's first serious bibliographer, a major collector, and an enormous pain in the ass to Kipling, was the Oxford-educated barrister E.W. Martindale, the first edition of whose bibliography, the first serious Kipling bibliography, although there'd been a couple of shorter attempts published as appendices, in 1922. He infuriated Kipling with simultaneously printing as an appendix to that work, this volume titled Fragmenta Condita, the unrecorded portion of my Kipling collection. And because it contained juvenilia that Kipling collected between covers or authorized its republication, this book is a Kipling first edition in all bibliographies. However, because it was privately printed and not sold, but rather given away to Martindale's friends, including Chandler, father of the Chandler collection at the Library of Congress, including Ellis Ames Ballard, his collection dispersed at auction the month after Pearl Harbor, where the Morgan Library managed to buy all the best things while the rest of the folks stayed away, thinking it was the end of civilization three weeks after Pearl Harbor. And it's never appeared at an auction house in any country. This colophon to the book claimed only 12 copies were printed, as you can see on the right-hand photograph. But Martindale wrote Mrs. Livingston at Harvard when she was bibliographing this at Harvard, that the printer, quote, did three extra copies, close quote, of which this may be one. There are now eight known copies since I acquired this one and another one bound in the back of copy number four of his bibliography, which he inscribed for his brother, his only brother. As I said, one presentation copy of Fragmenta Candida went to his friend, Admiral Lord Carpenter, now in Carpenter's collection at the LOC. Another inscribed copy went to Mrs. Livingston at Harvard, and a third inscribed to Ellis Ames Ballard was also a proof copy, but dispersed at his auction in January 1942 and is now at Cornell. The other two known copies are survivors in Stewart's collection at Dalhousie and California's Claremont College, where fittingly Tom Penny was professor of English for so many years. Next slide. Now, before collecting Kipling, I was impressed. I'd never studied European history. I was an American studies major at Yale. While studying modern history at Cambridge with the lives and works of the World War I poets. And I collected, before I collected Kipling, Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, and in the 1930s, according to Sassoon's biographer, Max Egremont, the poet had a lot of time on his hands and he painted watercolor caricatures, a little like Max Beerbaum, although not as talented, of among others, the Sitwells and of Kipling. Sassoon's old nanny, Rebecca Trussler, had worked for the Kipling family and Siegfried admired much of the older man's work. But by 1932, in a letter to fellow poet Edmund Blunden, he was satirizing Kipling's speech 
at the Royal Society of St. George, another Kipling first edition, later collected in his uh, uh, words book, um, when he claimed the country 1932, nine years before the phony war, that England must arm or perish. And this opinion was offensive to a man almost court-martialed for his notorious protest of the First World War when he hurled his medals, Mad Jack Sassoon, into the tents. Here, in a drawing entitled, Wonderful Man, Mr. Kipling, he depicts Kipling in cricketing gear. And behind him are King George V, labeled KG, to the left, with his leather gloves behind the batter. And Queen Mary appears to the right with her ermine stole and feathered toque. Next slide. Also from the 1930s, and also involving Queen Mary, is this 70 millimeter medal commissioned in 1936 to commemorate the launching in that year of the Queen Mary. 3,000 medals in bronze were struck, of which this is one in its original green leather gold stamped presentation case. Another five in gold were struck for the king, who like Kipling had died before the ship was launched, Queen Mary herself, the new King Edward VIII, and President and Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt. The obverse of the medal shown here features a distant view of the Hudson River and the towers of New York City. Just see it beyond the uh, uh, smokestacks there. Now, when asked for advice, Kipling had instead proposed images of the British lion and the American eagle. The chairman of the Cunard White Star Lines was Sir Percy Bates, whose friendship with Kipling had begun back in 1924. Volume six of Kipling's letters has much correspondence between them about the design and legending for this medal. And while his notion, Kipling's notion of royal profiles was rejected, the medal's obverse is consistent with his letter sketches of the images of the ship. And he did suggest a version of the Latin memo appearing on the medal, Marina Regina, Mary me commissit. Queen Mary committed me to the ocean. He adapted his draft suggestion from a phrase in his beloved Horace's Odes. But to Kipling's aggravation, his version was rejected by three Latin scholars who were consulted by the Royal Mint, which used their revised version, which I had just quoted. Still, Rudyard influenced both design and the motto. And in a year when many of us on both sides of the Atlantic may have watched the final season of The Crown, it's worth noting that the gold one presented to King Edward VIII in its blue leather case, not this cheaper green Morocco version, inscribed because he had been by then elevated, His Majesty the King, was auctioned at the Duke of Windsor's sale at Sotheby's in 1997 and acquired for $52,250, I'll let you do the pounds, by Mohammed Al-Fayed. Al-Fayed, of course, was the father of Princess Diana's lover, with whom she perished in the car accident in Paris. And he'd purchased it with all the other contents of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor's Paris home when he bought the lease to the house in the Bois de Boulogne and its contents. And then he consigned what he didn't want was all its contents for sale in the auction house. These are the bronze examples, like those at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich and at the British Museum. I published in that sale, to my astonishment and surprise and expense, the Legion book, which was the deluxe edition of a festrip to the British Legion of which the Prince of Wales had been the patron and 70 copies were published and had inserted in them original art works of art and full pages of autographs, including one with Lord George Clemenceau, but one of many of the authors, including Kipling. And the Prince of Wales was supposed to present these copies and sign them on the colophon 
And I discovered after I purchased it that I had the only copy in his own library, which he hadn't bothered to sign. He was a lazy man and we were fortunate not to have him as the English king. <laughs> Next. In 1898, the publisher William Heinemann brought together the great English woodblock artist, William Nicholson, who had gone down to Rotting Dean to paint Kipling's portrait, which is the portrait that appeared on the poster of my exhibition at Yale in 2007. And he was down there to produce an oversized plate book of images of the 12 months with sporting themes. Talking to Kipling, Kipling became interested in the project and he started to write verses. And the author's verses were described by Nicholson to Heinemann. Heinemann then commissioned Kipling to write the verses. And I discovered only two hours ago in WorldCat that 11 of the 12 verses, it's missing fishing, Kipling's holograph manuscripts are in the Morgan Library with his letter to Heinemann. The author's verses were printed in the United States in a copyright edition of 20 copies under the title Verses Written for Nicholson's Almanac of 12 Sports for 1898. You can read some of that just to the right. That was the title page. If you could move it back, uh, please. That was the title page of the 20 copy printing. Two went to the Library of Congress as required. The other 18 went to Heinemann for distribution to his friends. Now, Heinemann did three variants of this book, the so-called popular edition, which as we all know is another word for cheap, was on cartridge paper with no tissue guards between the lithographed version of Nicholson's plates, a library edition printed on Japanese vellum with protective tissue guards between the plates, and a deluxe edition, which is comprised of 12 wood cuts, hand covered and signed by the artist, sold loose in a portfolio case. That's what I bought in Paris last week, bound by an English collector, a British army major in 1898, and it only arrived in my house two nights ago. And my wife has not divorced me, but stay tuned. It's known that deluxe edition to exist in only four copies, all here in the United States, in Paul Mellon's collection at the Yale Center for British Art, naturally, in the uh, Clark Gallery Art Institute at the in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and one at the National Gallery. So this will be the only one in private hands, but it will go to next year uh, into uh, Yale. But in this edition, which Heinemann put together uh, for distribution with the poems put in, and here on what uh, Alex has uh, advanced, you will see it's advertised, came out in November 87. This was for the Christmas trade, popular edition, the one uh, on cartridge paper, two shilling sixpence. The library edition, the limited edition, Japanese vellum price, six shillings net. The edition deluxe, the one I just required, if you did it early on to subscribers, it was eight shillings, eight guineas, eight shillings and eight pounds. And on publication, it was raised to 12 shillings, 12 pounds. So this is the one that Heinemann produced in only 18 copies. The Nicholson plates are printed on the recto of each leaf, not on both sides as in the cheaper two editions, in a special binding visible here in full vellum boards with the cover illustration of the regular editions, but no titles on the front boards. And of course, as I said, the pages of the US copyright editions of the verses known to exist in only a dozen of the original copies including the ones interleaved here, are extant today. Uh, but of the original 18 special copies of the almanac pictured here, only four are known today. This one, one at the University of Delaware, and two in the British Library, 
I hope you waited for it, American Trust, won the deposit copy and won the Ashley Library copy. This example, this example's first auction appearance was in the sale of the Kipling collection of Ellis Ames Ballard in January 1942, the one I mentioned where prices were depressed because of the shock over Pearl Harbor only three weeks before the estate sale arranged, of course, before Pearl Harbor for the printing of the catalog. That is why you should get your executors to move quickly. But all the bids were depressed, and here it sold for $60. It was not purchased, as most of that auction's lots were, by the ever-confident director of the Morgan, Belle de Costa Green, but by the greatest Kipling dealer in the United States, James Drake. And it was acquired from him by another major Kipling collector, Doris Benz, but for some reason it did not appear in her auction at Christie's in November 1984. It reappeared in the market in 2022, 80 years after its sale by the Ballard Estate when a major rare book dealer priced it rather higher than its hammer price in 1942. Next slide. Kipling's poem, The Glory of the Garden, first appeared in his co-authored School History of England, a much derided work because it wasn't a very good history, by an Oxford professor in 1911. But this is the first separate edition, a glorious broadside, 15 and a quarter by 11 inches in size, privately printed by the master printer Walter Gillis in New York in November 1922, apparently solely for his own pleasure and without Kipling's authorization. Although Gillis was careful to include the copyright symbol, you can just see it at the bottom left of the right-hand leaf next to Kipling's name. Now, Gillis had a special status. He was the, quote, typographical advisor to Kipling's American publisher, Frank Nelson Doubleday, whom Kipling delighted in addressing as Effendi, F-N-D, Doubleday's initials. And the auction catalog of Gillis's archive, published in 1926, lists six copies of this broadside, three of them impressed on Holland paper. Ten years later, the auction catalog of the Arthur Scribner collection in 1936, Scribner, the first publisher of Kipling's collected works, who employed Frank Doubleday and who left Scribner's and took Kipling with him as a client notes that there were two bad typographical errors that were corrected, appearing in this edition by Gillis in a second edition on the more pedestrian Japan paper. So this edition, the first edition with the typos is known only in four copies known today. And it too seems to have once been in collection of Dorothy Benz, which I just described, but not in her 1984 auction. Ellis Ames Ballard, back to him, his copy at the post Pearl Harbor estate sale in January 42 was acquired at the price of $2 by the dealer James Brake, who had also acquired that copy of the special edition of the Almanac of 12 Sports, and he seems to have sold it to Benz. The last copy of this at auction appeared in 1948, three years after I was born. The other extant copies of this first edition may be found in the Library of Congress, again, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas, and in the Berg Collection at the New York Public Library, which also has, not surprisingly, for the Berg, the second edition. Concluding, if you would, Alex. My final item is my latest acquisition acquired at Christie's in a London online auction last December. Now, Christie's didn't seem to have really done much homework, auction houses don't, about learning that there are three known autograph manuscript copies, which collectors call AMSs, of the absent-minded beggar. One is in Stewart's collection at Dollhousie, which is the one used by the Daily Mail to raise money for its Widows and Orphans Fund as reproduced on paper, silk, satin, and earthenware pottery like the tea set with 
teapot, creamer, sugar, cup and saucer, and tray, pictured in my catalog, some of you have it, of my Kipling exhibition published by Yale in 2007. The second known AMS is in the British Library, missing the third stanza, and with a title added in pencil in a bound manuscript of Kipling's 1919 poetry collection, The Years Between, in which book it was first collected by the author. This is the only known draft, which first appeared mysteriously at auction 21 years before last year, in 1992, and then again four months ago. We know it's a draft, which from Kipling's wife's Carrie's diary seems to have written, been written on or about 16 October, 1899, because if you look very closely, hard to see even on this reproduction, it's written crosswise on both sides of one sheet, that's why you can see through and see the writing on the other side, of lined tablet paper. You can tell it's lined tablet paper because if you look to the left of the first page, you can see where the glue was, where Kipling removed it from a tablet lined horizontally with that edge and then rotated the paper 90 degrees and wrote on both sides of it this roughly fair copy. But it's missing the hyphen in the title. It has a different stanza structure than the final, which was not organized as here by Roman numerals and it even includes an extra line, not in the final version, which was to be published if he wrote it on 16 October or very near that date, as soon as 31 October in the Daily Mail. Now that I have reveled like Kipling's commercial traveler in some aspects of travel in looking again at some of my samples, I hope you can see, which was what I was intended to do, how these 10 items illustrate various aspects of the general madness of book collecting in particular, and of collecting Rudyard Kipling exclusively. Thank you. Many, many thanks to you, Dave, for that series of dazzling apasu into your uh, collecting practice and collecting habits.